Okay, this is the one <laughs> that I fought not to have to deliver, and it's by no means a judgment on anybody, but even after I realized what the truth was, I went back on this myself. Just want to let you know that, <laughs> you know, it's not my intention to offend, but this is what I believe the Lord is asking me to deliver today, and so... I remember when I was a young airman and a new believer, I was stationed in San Antonio and someone told me about this amazing ministry that I would learn a lot from. It was called New Creation Christian Fellowship. And they told me about the pastors and how anointed that they were and that they had never understood the word of God like they did after sitting under these pastors. And the way that these pastors delivered the word was something brand new to them. So I got excited. I decided to get there and to sit under these amazing people and hear what says the Lord. And I got there. It was a medium size, like a storefront back then, but the place was packed. It was no doubt that they needed or were in the process of making plans to expand. The buzz was almost electric as we waited for service to start. Praise and worship was good and the spirit was moving in that place. I was a man, I was shocked, you know. And as the worship team left the platform, a lady who I perceived to be maybe someone who was gonna say the announcement began to pray. And so I was like, oh, okay. And so I bowed my head and I prayed with her. And then she went right into the most riveting message that I had ever heard. Up until then, I would read my Bible kind of, sort of, but not really, and just put it down after saying, well, I, I don't understand that. But because of what I heard that day and how she delivered God's word with such simplicity and understanding, I had a new hunger for God's word, for reading the Bible, and asked God to give me a gift of teaching and to deliver the message the way I heard her deliver it that day. I never forget that. It was the most amazing thing. I was, I was just, everybody was filing out after service, and I was just sitting there stuck like Chuck. So I'm saying that Pastor Claudette Copeland, through you, God opened me up to his word. I thought she was the pastor after hearing her deliver such a riveting message, but I went back and there stood her husband delivering the word of God as he was a powerhouse within himself. Now, you know, I was really off balance at that point. Pastor David Copeland, or Bishop, for what I understand now, David Copeland, they were double teaming that thing. An amazing couple in Christ. One of my first experiences of how not only marriage, but teamwork and ministry should be. As I watched them and I continued to go there, I witnessed them operating in their gifts simultaneously, but even apart. Staying in their own lanes and accentuating the gifts of each other. Up until then, I didn't think that that sort of thing was possible because of the way I was raised. I was raised in a very chauvinistic household. Uh, predominantly, my grandfather was the man of the house, and what he said, wit! There was no double-talking, back-talking, questioning him, you know, and so that was for everybody in the family. And so I saw a new thing that day. And so we live in a culture that is so out of line with what God meant for it to be. But they showed me the equality in God's intent for us and in what he created. It was an amazing experience for a young Christian. So to the Copelands, I hope you are doing well. I just Googled you, so I know that you're still on the grind for Jesus. Just know that you made a real difference in my life and now in my ministry. So let me get right into it. There's much speculation on what roles belong to who in the church, as well as in the family. It seems that the enemy is having his way, not only in church, but in our families. But hopefully we can get some understanding on how God thinks about it right here on this episode of Word on the Street with JP right here on YouTube's Rain Radio ATL. Man, don't you touch that dial because I'll be right back, man. I, I'm, I'm excited to do this one, so come on back now.
Hey there, family, and thank you so much for listening and watching Word on the Street with JP right here on Rain Radio ATL on YouTube. And this episode is most likely going to offend some, so get ready. And if you're easily offended, now would probably be the time to move on to the next video. But I hope you'll stick around and hear what's on my heart and what I perceive to be on the heart of God as well. I was looking at one of my favorite online preachers, Jack Hibbs, and he said something that really stuck with me. He talked about how the man is ferociously under attack by the enemy. And in saying that, I'm by no means a chauvinist or women's liver, and I stand for the rights and the feelings of all women to the point that I believe there's a shortage of faith-filled men that God is using ladies to minister the gospel. It just is what it is. And some argue that women don't belong in the pulpit. And I think that that was founded out of some sort of cultural bias of that time written by one of the disciples, but was never communicated to the masses by Jesus. But we ain't going to go into all that today. That's not what we're going to really get into today. That's a teaching for another day. But what I want to talk about today is I've heard some moving and useful messages in my day, and even some that were delivered by the opposite sex. One in particular that changed my life forever. And if it had not been for what I witnessed that day with the Copeland's New Creation Christian Fellowship, I don't think I would be the same. And so what I want to address today is the faithfulness of the true people of God and the fact that we as a body must give greater attention to the things of God and the spreading of his good news, letting nothing else distract us or dissuade us from doing just that. And yet there are some, even in the body of Christ, who depend on what they think that they know to be right. But having neither employed the Spirit during their study time, and some don't study at all. But for the ones who do, I'm grateful to God for the earnest longing to know the true mind of Christ. So did you know that most of those who hear and respond to the messages that I produce are women? And I thank God for faithful women of God. And when we visit our local fellowships, we almost always see the women carrying the mantle that the men were charged to carry by God. So yeah, the argument might be that men are appointed to preach the gospel. But when Christ came on the scene, he went from the law to grace. And he changed all that up. Instead of trying to keep the law, he went into grace. And that it was no longer a works-based religion, but a relational situation between man and God. And so, yeah, men were charged to carry that mantle, but have failed by and large. So where did all the men of God go? And if they are there, why do they continue? Why do we continue to allow, instead of working in concert with the lady, to carry the whole burden? Now, don't get me wrong. There are a lot of men that I respect in the church doing what God told them to do. But by and large, women are the influencers in most ministries, hands down. No, that may not be how some perceive that it was meant to be, I know. But I must beg to differ in regards to how women affect ministry. And we'll just have to agree to disagree on this one. And if I'm found to be in error, I'll just take it up with the king of all kings when we get there. And so the fact of the matter is that we who are the family of faith are called, all of us, to go out into the highways and into the byways and preach the gospel to every living creature. Jesus didn't explicitly say for the men. He said, all of us. So according to Luke, the 14th chapter, the 16th verse through the 24th verse, he gives a good indication of why things have changed so drastically. It starts out in verse 16 where it says, Then he said to him, A certain man gave a great supper and invited many, verse 17, and sent his servant at supper time to say to those who were invited, Come for all things are now ready. Verse 18, but they all with one accord began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a piece of ground and I must go and see it. I ask you to have me excused. Verse 19, and another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I am going to test them. I ask you to have me excused. Verse 20, still another said, I have married a wife and therefore I cannot come. Verse 21, so that the servant came and reported these things to the master. 
Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city, and bring in here the poor and the maimed and the lame and the blind. Verse 22. And the servant said, Master, it is done as you commanded, and still there is room. Verse 23. Then the master said to the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. Verse 24. For I say to you that none of those men who are invited shall taste my supper. Okay, so I know you're thinking, well, that doesn't pertain to the servant going out. It pertains to the ones that are invited in. And I understand. But we were all invited in. And for all those who were invited in, God gave the commandment for all of us who believe. So we become servants at that point. And we're all bid to go out into the highways and into the byways and preach this gospel. So yeah, I believe that back when the gospel was new, there was a mandate for men to take up the calling of holding higher positions in the ministry. But since the man and his sons have been under such ferocious attack, some have either been distracted or shamed to the point where they just let the mantle lie on the ground. But the will of the Father is that the message would still go forth. If the man won't do it, who will? So the issue isn't with those who are seeking the truth, but with the ones who have made up in their minds that what they believe is true without seeking what God says about it. And just like in the scripture that we just read, those who were called found license not to attend. The master of the feast made it available to all who would come and to participate in that which the unwilling won't. So yeah, women in the pulpit. If that's what it's going to take to get the world in position for salvation, I don't believe that there's any longer an issue of gender. Sorry. So everyone who believes is mandated to spread this gospel. Let's not get all caught up in the weeds about these sorts of things. Just majoring in the minors. We can't play in the major league with the minor league mentality. So from the beginning, man was the target of the devil. Man had a target on his back. The enemy knew that Adam was too close to God to come at him. So he went through Eve. Not saying that she was any way inferior to Adam, but what the word of God infers is that Adam hadn't put Eve up to speed on the things that were even in the garden, as this is not mentioned at all. So, it, you know, it goes into how Adam walked with God in the cool of the evening, and it goes into how God set Adam up to name all the animals, and, and it goes into all that, but it doesn't say that Adam explained the rules of the garden to Eve. And even though she may have known, he was supposed to lead her in the truth. So my question is, was Adam slipping in his role to instruct Eve? I'm just saying, so that's a question that we'll have to find out either when we get there or um, we can ask the Holy Spirit on what the answer is. But this is the same thing that is happening today. And since we're living in such a fallen world, the man still has a target on his back because the enemy has confidence that this tactic works. And consequently, it does. And man is losing horribly. But thank God for Jesus. For he says that the battle is his, you know, <laughs> the battle is mine, saith the Lord. So, but case in point, if you notice that even TV commercials perpetuate this, as when there's a scene involving our youth, there's almost always a mother or a female figure guiding them. Very seldom do we see a man involved or a family unit at work. It's sad to say, but it's playing out not only in our churches, but in our communities as well. So when we go to church, in children's ministry, there is always a woman in charge. But what we fail to realize is that we don't go to church to put our little ones in little people's ministry just to have a babysitter. We're supposed to put them there so they can be taught the things of God. Not only the things of God, but the order and the balance of God. Not just to pacify the parents until service is over. Not just to get them out of the way. And so my question to that is, where's the male influencer? I believe this is why we have such a confusion when the youth come of age and are in a quandary over if they should be ID'd as a he or a she. I'm just saying, when are we going to have the hard conversations and truly influence as a male 
and sow into the lives of our little people. Men, we have to wake up and do what we are ordained to do from the beginning, and that is to lead our families in the ways of God instead of washing the car or going golfing or hunting while our women sit in the pew trying to prepare to take up the slack for us at home. I know that this is a hard piece of meat to chew, but it needs to be swallowed for it to be nourishing. So ladies, you're not off the hook, so I know you're sitting back looking like the Cheshire cat, but let's let our men be men and take off the mantle that he's meant to carry, especially if you see him trying, because prying it from your cold, hard hands is hard for him. It's humiliating and very frustrating. I sat in that seat. Agree to follow him as he follows Christ, and we'll see a lot less influence from the world in our homes. Be a cooperative when it comes to raising our youth. Adding your strength with his strength, his strength with your strength, because it's not the sole responsibility of neither, but both in unison, so there can be balance added to the lives of our teeny weeny ones. So in summary, walk in what God has called us to walk in. Let's stay in our lanes. And if there are any questions or disagreements that are causing division in the family, make the word of God the final authority. But first we have to take it to him to find out what his intentions are for our lives. And all that can be found in the pages of his word. The answers are there if we only look for them. So I hope you got a lot out of that message. It was a hard one for me to do because it, you know, if I point at you, I'm pointing back at me too. And yeah, I've, I've I, I, you know, yeah, man. Anyway, so thank you for listening, watching Word on the Street with JP. I'm your host, JP. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior and you want to or you simply want to rededicate your lives, you can do that now. One thing you got to do is believe that God the Father sent his only begotten son to die for our sin debt. Believe that he was beaten, put on the cross, died, rose on the third day, defeating death, hell, and the grave. Jesus did that for us. He loves us that much and is now seated at the right hand of the Father in intercession for all those who do and would come to him. So confess your sins to him. Turn away from those sins or repent. Ask Jesus into your heart and begin to living out the life that Jesus intended us to live in total surrender to him and in total service to other people in love. And so I believe that if you got down on your knees and you prayed for that gift of salvation, that you are one of the newest members of the family of faith. So I want to be one of the first to say, welcome to the family. My first recommendation for you is to get back with those folks that was trying to bring you to Christ. Tell them that you did and then get involved with a Bible-based ministry, one that rightly divides the word so you can begin to learn the mind of Christ and serve him by serving people. And so thank you so much for listening, watching Word on the Street with JP. Let's pray for the peace of Israel. Pray for our governing bodies, global, federal, and local, that they would come to the full knowledge of how much God loves them, bringing them to salvation. And so take care of yourselves. Take care of one another. And if I don't see you on this side, I'll see you on the other side. But until then, that's right. I'll see you on the radio. Shalom.